coming from our thematic scripture for the year, Jeremiah 29 and 11. And beginning at Jeremiah 29 and 10, and also as a reference scripture, Joel 2 and 25. At Jeremiah 29 and 10, you will find these words. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and keep my good promise to you, causing you to return to this place. At Jeremiah 29 and 11, it reads, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare to prosper you and not for calamity to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. At Joel 2 and 25, you'll find these words, and this is the NIV version of it, I will repay you for the years that the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locust and the locust warm, my great army that I sent among you. This morning I want to speak for a few minutes from the topic, God made it that way. God made it that way. You may be seen. Jeremiah is one of the four major prophets, and he is often called the weeping prophet, or the prophet of loneliness, because he was commanded not to marry in Jeremiah 16.2. He prophesied to Judah and nations during the reigns of Josiah, Joahaz, Joachim, Joachim, and Zedekiah, the king of Judah. The book of Jeremiah was written between the years of 627 and 585 BC. Jeremiah began his ministry around the age of 20 under King Josiah. He was considered to be sensitive and sympathetic by nature, yet he was commanded by God to deliver a stern message of judgment. The opposition he faced to the message was cruel and crushing, leading him to want to resign from his office as a prophet. However, he did not give up, and he continued to proclaim God's word. This year's guide on thematic scripture is taken from a letter written by Jeremiah while he is in Jerusalem to the Jews while they are in Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. Understanding the scripture requires a crash course in Jewish history and international relations at the time within which it occurs. I wish we could just be topical and focus on the key scripture, pull a couple reference scriptures and get excited, jump up and down and go home. However, doing that would take away from the necessary focus required to fully understand the core text, which has many prophetic implications for this age, which is why today's homily is both historical and prophetic. So I understand why the people who aren't here on the first Sunday of this year aren't here, because the prophecy is not for them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be prophesying to the wind, and you just have to grab a hold onto that which is for you. The Babylonian captivity is an important period of biblical history, because both the captivity and exile and return and restoration of the Jewish nation were fulfillments of Old Testament prophecies. God used Babylon as his agent of judgment against Israel for their sins of idolatry and rebellion against him. There were actually several different times during the period between the years of 607 and 586 BC when the Jews were taken captive by Babylon. With each successive rebellion against the Babylonian rule, Nebuchadnezzar would in return lead his armies against Judah until the Babylonian army would lay siege to Jerusalem for over a year, killing many people and destroying the Jewish temple, taking captive many thousands of Jews and leaving Jerusalem in ruins. Under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar II, the Babylonian empire spread throughout the Middle East and around 607 BC, King Joachim of Judah was forced into submission, becoming a vessel to Nebuchadnezzar. And the reference for that is 2 Kings 24 and 1. It was during this time that Nebuchadnezzar took many of the finest and brightest young men from each city in Judah captive, including Dana, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or as people like to refer to them by the Babylonian name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. After three years of serving Nebuchadnezzar, Joachim of Judah rebelled against Babylonian rule and once again turned to Egypt for support. While sending his army to deal with Judah's revolt, Nebuchadnezzar also left Babylon himself in 598 BC to deal with the problem. When he arrived in Jerusalem around March of 597 BC, Nebuchadnezzar seized Jerusalem and he took control of the entire area, looting it and taking captive with him King Joachim of Judah. 
his family, and almost all of the population of Judah, leaving only the poorest people of the land. Your reference scripture for that, if you're taking notes, would be 2 Kings 24, verses 8 through 16. 2 Kings 24, verses 8 through 16. At that time, Nebuchadnezzar appointed King Zedekiah to rule as his representative over Judah. But after nine years and still not having learned their lesson, Zedekiah led Judah again in rebellion against Babylon one final time. And this is documented in 2 Kings 24 through 25. Being influenced by false prophets and ignoring Jeremiah's warnings, Zedekiah decided to join a coalition that was being formed by Edom, Moab, Ammon, and Phoenicia in rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar. This resulted in Nebuchadnezzar again laying siege to Jerusalem. Tell somebody that false prophets will always lead you wrong. They will always lead you wrong. Jer Jerusalem fell in July 586 BC as a result of listening to the word of the false prophets and the coalition that Zedekiah joined along <clears throat> with Judah. And as a result of this, Zedekiah saw his sons being killed before his very eyes, and then he was taken to have his own eyes plucked out. At this time, Jerusalem was laid to waste. The temple or the church was destroyed. All the houses were burned, and the majority of the Jewish people were taken captive. But again, Nebuchadnezzar left a remnant of poor people to serve as farmers and vine dressers. As prophesied in scripture, the Jewish people would be allowed to return to Jerusalem 70 years after 70 years of exile. That prophecy was fulfilled in 537 BC, and the Jews were allowed by King Cyrus to return to Israel and begin rebuilding the city and the temple. The return under the direction of Ezra led to a revival among the Jewish people and the rebuilding of the temple. As I previously stated, the text is situated within Jeremiah's letter to King Nebuchadnezzar, who was in control of the 3,023 Jews who were taken to Babylon in 597 BC, after he destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and effectively ended the Davidic monarch. The purpose of this specific letter is to exhort the Jews to live as normal a life as possible while in captivity to await God's deliverance and to disregard false prophets such as Ahab and Zedekiah. So we have a promise here of welfare and hope being delivered to the Jews to be demonstrated by God after they lived in captive exile for 70 years. Now that's more than a lifetime for many people, which means that apart from being killed during the series of revolts, there were some of the 3,023 who were taken captive who would die naturally while they're in captivity, apart from those who had died during the series of successive revolts. While I'm talking to you this morning, I just want you to consider the impact and the effects of fighting battles God does not want you to fight. If you fight while in exile, and if the will of God is for you to be in exile for your own sin, you are ultimately fighting against God, and you will lose. Losing may just mean you lose your life. It may mean you lose your land. It means your land will be worse off than it was when you were removed because God will allow the enemy that he sends to rule over you and to rule over it and to make it a wasteland. Remember I just stated that after that last battle that everything was destroyed in Jerusalem. Whereas if you just hold your peace a little while longer, if you just stand still and wait to see the salvation of the Lord versus standing and fighting, running back to a place where God does not want you in and opening the door for war on your own territory, things will be better at the end of the judgment that you're facing. The purpose of judgment here was for Israel to learn a lesson and not to fight. The purpose of judgments we face is to learn to place God first, to avoid depending on global systems, to avoid putting secular responsibilities ahead of God, and to return with greater appreciation to the land that belongs to us. In today's text, Israel is living in what appears to be a hopeless situation, as strangers and as foreigners. Living in a land that did not belong to them after their forefathers were given the promised land, the land of Canaan, the land that was promised to be flowing with milk and honey. Here they are living in a place that they fought hard to get out of, that they revolted to leave continuously and successively and continue to find themselves being forced to return because they could not effectively leave until the time period for God's judgment had passed. 
regardless of how hard you try to fight until the judgment is up, you cannot be released from captivity. The letter within which I reference scripture is situated was sent by the hand of Elastor, the son of Shephi, to Nebuchadnezzar. And that's where we find our reference scripture for today. Elasso was a descendant of Judah, of the family of Hezron, and also he was a descendant of King Saul. The name Elasso means God made or who God made. An important point to make at this juncture is that everything God makes and ordains is not easy to live with. In Jeremiah 29 and 4 informs us that the Lord of hosts called Israel to be carried into exile. And we've been studying the book of John, and it's within the book of John that John tells us that all things were made by the hand of God, and without God there was nothing made that was made, there was nothing formed that was formed, there was nothing created that has been created, except for God and the Lord creating it themselves. So when we look at the exile, and we look at the Babylonian captivity here, it's not that Babylon one day decided, well, we're going to go on and we're just going to do this. No, God actually designed it and he created it to fulfill his purpose. So the Lord of hosts caused Israel to be carried into exile. God representing himself as the Lord of hosts means that he is the master of world leaders. This is why Jeremiah was able to see Nebuchadnezzar as God's agent. Now, although Israel saw Nebuchadnezzar as an enemy, and because, ne not, and because Jeremiah was able to see Nebuchadnezzar as God's agent, Israel didn't like him even the more. Even when you come to tell people the truth and when you come to speak truth, people many times will not want to accept it and listen to it and will get upset with you, especially if it just doesn't make sense. That's why we got to have the wisdom of God. Sometimes God uses our enemies and places our enemies in our paths to shake us out of a place and a state of complacent expectations where we think we can do anything and live any kind of way and still be blessed. And, and see, that was the problem with Israel, they had fell into idolatry and fell into worship of man-made articles and man-made things and God was no longer important. So here we see God allowing an enemy to shake them out of the place where he called them to live into a land that he gave them. He forced them into exile and allowed them to be able to see the enemy that they thought going into and laying waste to the land. Exile was a very uncomfortable situation, and it is a very uncomfortable situation. However, the Jews disobeyed God, and they broke the first two commandments after being released from Egypt. God is a jealous God, and when he attempts, or when we attempt to glorify anything else above him, we open ourselves up to his judgment. So the judgment, albeit uncomfortable, was still purposeful. It was set up to bring a chosen people back to the chosen place which God had given them. The judgment was set up to bring a chosen people back to the chosen place which God gave them. Now get this, the place was meant to be intact when they returned at first. It wasn't until they decided they would keep fighting that the place laid in ruins. But their actions of rebellion and resistance against God's enemy agent caused the place to be in a condition that God never intended for it to be. We've got to learn how to avoid blaming God for the mess in our lives or the mess of our lives. We've got to avoid blaming God for the issues we create and stop blaming the devil for everything wrong. Some stuff is wrong because we made it wrong. We put our hands on it, we put our mouth on it, and we messed it up. We moved outside of proper timing. God sent word through Jeremiah that after these 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. But Israel acted like they couldn't wait 70 years. And even within the first year, they started revolting because exile was just that bad. Not under Understanding that if God said it, even though you might not like it, it's still going to happen the way that God said for it to happen. We have to learn how to move when the timing is right and to move with the correct attitude. Part of Israel's problem was not only just that they moved outside of proper timing, but they moved with an incorrect attitude. We don't care what God says. Jeremiah, you don't know what you're talking about. There's no way that God can be using Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is a Babylonian king. How can God be punishing us for idolatry and then use an idolatrous leader to judge us. That just doesn't make any sense, but God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And sometimes God will use 
things that don't seem right to men to get men right together. And so God's prophecy was for the period of 70 years. Yet Israel decided before that time period was up, they would get themselves out of Babylon, out of judgment, and each and every time they did, God allowed for them to return. It's just like today when you get a, a judgment against you that the court has ordered you to pay, or you get a ticket and it turns into a judgment. You may decide, well, I'm not going to pay this ticket, but after so long, you can only drive and go and walk so far until you're going to be arrested and detained until you fulfill, my God, that judgment. I've come today to encourage somebody to let you know that God has allowed these last couple of years to be uncomfortable for the saints because the church has gotten away from its calling and from its purpose of choosing. Since God loves the church, the church has been chastened and circumcised because God wants his people in their rightful place, upholding him in his rightful place. Before 2010, the church and church folk became too idolatrous caught up too much in political schemes and in political scandal and in political purposes and intent. So God has judged his people evidenced by economic scarcity and other levels of discomfort to cut away the excess foreskin which is useless and requires extra maintenance and clean, cleaning to prevent uncleanliness and filth from perpetrating his people. The cutting away is demonstrated by the waste and destruction that God allows the enemy to leave behind after we fight against his will to fully separate ourselves from worldly things. Thus, the biblical destruction of the temple. It's a terrible day when God has to destroy his church in order to get the church's attention because he wants the central focus to be on him all along. This year, I believe God is preparing his church for a different type of move. Not only this year, but this season, this age, during which tradition, church as usual, people as usual, ministry as usual, will not be effective and will not work. I believe that God is preparing his church, and when I say church, I mean his people. We are the church. We are the living, walking churches. We are the temple, preparing us for a move during which traditional authority and mechanisms of control within the church institution will not be effective. And anything extra, every extra practice, every extra paradigm, every extra worldview, every extra theory has to be cut away because except Christ lived, died, and rose, and takes away the sins of the world is the only message that people really want to hear. They want to know that, yes, there is a savior of the world, and he can save me out of the place that I'm in, even in the land that I'm in. If I'm living in exile, I can still have peace where I'm at because Christ is still Messiah and because he is the Lord of hosts and he is the ruler of all rulers, my God, that he's still in control even when it don't look like I am in agreement with his authority and with his strategies of control. My God, my God, I can still have peace here. So every extra theory which says name it and claim it, get out of the place of discomfort and move to a comfortable place because God does not want you uncomfortable has got to be done away with. Sometimes we don't grow until we go through something that's uncomfortable. You don't know that you need a new shoe and that the previous shoe is too small until something grows. You, you don't know how ignorant you really were you used to be until your mind grows and you accept something new, a new thought. Oh my God, my God. Messages of prosperity and fast growth without work will no longer be acceptable and effective because people are learning that even with hard work they find themselves in the same position yes. while they're living in exile. Even though Israel worked and fought hard to get out of Babylonian captivity before its time. They worked and worked and worked and worked and still found themselves going right back to the place where God wanted them to be until they learned the lesson that God wanted them to learn. Growing closer, the church has got to grow closer to the realization that the judgment of God right now is upon the nations and except he withhold his judgment and transitions the nations back into grace, things will not get better because his grace is sufficient and he will give grace to his church in the world and during the time when the global community is experiencing judgment. However, the church has got to get to the place where it tarries again. The church has got to get back to the place where it calls upon the name of the Lord again. The church needs to get back to the place where we bleed the blood of Jesus again. We've got to stop being so sophisticated and, and so sedated that we don't know how to fall on our faces and get on our knees and get into the face of God. The 
church needs to return to the message of salvation and holiness and stop playing to the quasi needs of wealthy people who come and attend. This is what the church was sanctioned to do. These are the things that God made the church for. So King Zedekiah sent Elasa to Babylon to deliver this letter to Nebuchadnezzar for the purpose of the perceived enemy Nebuchadnezzar to deliver the words to Israel himself. So get this, God is allowing a prophet to send a word to what's considered to be an enemy to speak to God's people. I can imagine Israel becoming even more enraged and outraged, not only against Nebuchadnezzar, but against the prophet Jeremiah, because how can you allow and think that God is going to use the enemy to speak to us? But I found out that if you just listen to what your enemy has to say, many times you'll learn exactly what you need to hear and get in order to get out of the place where you are in because God will use your enemy to get you out of exile. I can imagine just the thought of Israel saying, no, 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 this can't be right. And it's almost blasphemy that you would think that God will allow this king over here to tell us to get comfortable in exile in a, form, in a foreign land that we don't own, that we don't possess anything in. But sometimes we have to live in the master's house to learn the master's way in order to excel in the master's game. Let me repeat that. Sometimes we've got to live in the master's house to learn the master's way in order to excel and beat the master at his own game. Let me give you some inconvenient research to back that up. Light-skinned Negroes in the African-American antebellum South worked in the house because they were the master's children and were biologically closer to the master's family. Therefore, the master took better care of them and allowed them to work on the inside of the house. And while in the house, they excelled in literature, arts, reading, writing, and arithmetic. They were taught the master's tools while living in the master's house. Today, it is a documented fact that lighter skinned blacks still receive better treatment by whites in the labor market. They are offered jobs first, they are paid at higher levels and are more represented in executive positions. They tend to work in the office and not in the field or in the line. Yes, sometimes you have to learn the master's tools while living in the master's house to excel at the master's game. This is why Moses was allowed to be reared in the Egyptian Pharaoh's house, knowing that God would one day use him to get his own people released. He had to go and be raised in the master's house and know how to speak the king's language so that he could come back and say, King God just said, I am that I am. Amen. And he wants you to let his people go. And not only that, but I am one of those. My God, my God. So let's connect this to the text. Beginning in 29 and 5, the letter says, Build yourselves houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take wives and sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not be diminished. And seek the peace and welfare of the city to which I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it, for that place. For in the welfare of that city in when, within which you live, you will also have welfare. Get this. How would you feel if while being held captive in the enemy's territory, in the enemy's country, God doesn't send a word that says, I'm going to immediately deliver you, but instead I want you to get happy where you are. I want you to get happy there in Babylon. I want you to live life and seek peace there in that place. Some things in life won't change until we get happy in the places where we are. Plenty won't return until we get happy with desolation and living in a desert-like condition. Some things won't happen and plenty won't come back until we learn how to be creative and creative takes nothing and makes something out of it. Some things won't happen until you learn how to pray for your enemies. Your welfare and your well-being is tied to the well-being of your enemy. That's why your enemy is your footstool. And if your enemies are always down, you can't rise that high. But the higher your enemies get, oh my God, if our enemies are our footstool, the higher and better able, then oh my God, capable to elevate and lift us higher. So you pray for your enemies and you love on your enemies because your well-being is tied to the well-being of your enemies. And not only that, but it's even tied to other nations here. Why? Because God just made it that way. Get this, even in today, in the realm of international relations, the world watches the economy. 
economies of all of the largest economies. Knowing if the economy of Greece falters, it has implications on the euro. And if the economies of other European nations go down, then you know, it has implications on the entire Western world. The world watches the economies of Japan and China to determine how much of a threat it will be to the world's largest economy, the United States. Although our economy is still nine times larger than the economy of China, the greatest threat is the Chinese economy. For the purpose of determining the tide of political and economic control for years to come, we watch the economies of these nations. But lest the world forget that the Lord of hosts is still in control. Why? Just because God made it that way. So while knowing here, talking back to Israel, while knowing that back home every house in Judea has been my God, destroyed and is in ruins. The temple is destroyed. The church is destroyed. Mass graves have been dug to create and maintain the casualties of battle. The marketplace has even been destroyed. Some loved ones will never be seen again while here on earth, and some will even die while we're living in Babylon. In the midst of knowing that, when they return, everything will be in a mess, and it's going to have to be recreated, and it's their fault. There's nothing like knowing it's a mess, and you made it a mess, and now you got to make the mess better. My God, what God says, when 70 years I created, or 70 years are up for you in Babylon, I will then revisit you and keep my good promise to you. And I will cause you to return to this place because I know the thoughts and the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and plans for welfare and not for evil to give you hope and the future in your final outcome. Why does it have to take 70 years? Why does it have to take so long for delivering sometimes? Because God made it that way. After time has passed, there is no more resistance in you. After time has passed, you lost the will to fight. You no longer want to fight. And you just say, God, you just have your way. God, I'm going to let you be God. After time has passed, the only thing you want to do is fall on your knees and pray. Because God made it and set it up to be that way. That's why verse 12 here says, then you will call upon me, and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear you, and I will heed you. Then you will seek me, inquire me, and require me as a vital necessity, and find me when you search me with all your heart. Sometimes some things have to happen, and it's got to go on for a long period of time. We have to feel cut off in order for us to really develop a, a deep yearning for God. That's why Isaiah said, like the deer panteth after the water but so does my soul long for you, oh God. I'm tired of living in the desert. I'm tired of living in this place, and I'm tired of being in this land. And so, God, I'm not going to resist you anymore. I will find you to be a part of my day each and every day. You are a vital necessity to my well-being and to my welfare. And so now, I have no problem with falling on my face. Before, I had a problem with the prophet, and I got mad with the prophet when they told me that this was set up by you. And I didn't want to obey, and I didn't listen, and I made a mess even messier. But now, God, I just need you to fix it. Oh, so God wants us to be at the place where we totally depend on him, and where we only talk to him. God says, oh my God, when we require him to be a necessity in our lives, he will heed and listen to our prayers. It's God don't hear every prayer. That's we got into that little argument in the Bible study a few weeks ago. Not until God sees that you are requiring him as a necessity in your life, he's not listening to you. Not until you are a saved person and have prayed the prayer of repentance. God don't want to hear what you've got to say. If you pray and you still want to go out and fix it your way, God ain't got nothing to do with that and he's not going to follow through. But not until you say, God, I'm going to let you be God. You are the Lord of hosts and you are in control. Oh, here. Will he listen and will he hear? It is then that we are released from captivity and see the outcome which God made. The outcome is in verse 14. It says, I will be found by you. The outcome is you will be able to see God in whatever it is that you're dealing with. Even though it's uncomfortable, you'll be able to look at it and get the lesson God wants you to get out of it. You'll be able to look at it and see the handiwork in God. You will be able to find the Lord and God will release us from it says, and gather you from all the nations and the places which I carried you to be captive in. Now get this, the peace of you. 
that you left in your past is going to meet up with the piece of you that you now know. Do not consider yourself to be wounded in sky, but this is the year that you will be made whole. The piece of you that is bound by past mistakes will be released and free to meet your final outcome. Because God knows the thoughts and the plans that he has for you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end and a desirable outcome. Through it all and though it all, and though you have to experience that stuff, God made it and he constructed it. He created it this way to bring Israel back to its chosen place. He created things in your life and allowed them to go this way to bring you back back to your chosen place, to bring Israel back to its calling. They may not have liked the words of Jeremiah and listened to false prophets, but the word of Jeremiah showed itself to be right. Whether or not you like it, God will use an enemy to correct you, to chasten you, and to reposition you where he wants you to be. Whether or not you like it, God will send the words you don't want to hear because warning goes before destruction. But the word is to protect you. The word is to guide you. The word is to show the path that you want to take even when you don't want to take it. God made it that way. That's why David said thy word have I hid in my heart and the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So when you move from desolation back to restoration we have to depend on the God who repays us for our difficult times and that's why Joel 2 and 25 says I will repay you for the years that the locusts have eaten, the great locusts, the pepper worm and the palm worm, my great army which I have sent out among you. And as I get ready to close this message, I encourage you this year and in this season, in this time, to expect God to repay you for your difficulty. That's why he said through Joel 2 and 25, I'm going to repay you. The King James Version says, I will restore. When God restores, he's just repaying. Expect, expect God to restore the things the enemy plundered. Watch God rebuild every piece of your life that has been broken and destroyed and bound by enemy fire. Watch God and expect God to repay you in a good way and to give you a double portion for the destruction that even you brought into yourself. Expect a double portion of life. Expect a double portion of health. Expect a double portion of strength. Expect a double portion of labor. Expect a double portion of resources. You don't have to go from paycheck to paycheck because your resources are going to be double. Oh my God. Expect favor on your child and favor in your business, favor in your mind and in your thinking, favor in your relationships, knowing and trusting that every place that God allows you to be, whether or not you just sit and have what you consider to be a menial conversation, that God set it up that way for it to work in your favor. Seek the welfare of the place within which you find yourself. Seek the well-being of every person with whom you come into contact with. Seek the face of God and you will find him. He'll be waiting and listening for your call. The Bible says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God is faithful and he delivers out of them all. Seek the peace of God. Seek the understanding of God. Seek the wisdom of God. God in everything in your life to lead you, oh my God, back to the place of your choosing to lead you back to the place of your call, to lead you back to the place of favor. God made it this way to lead you back to his face. And that's the word of the Lord this morning. Go ahead and give God a praise for that. This word is for everybody. It's only for those who, oh my God, who are evil and willing to accept that it's been uncomfortable because God set it up that way. And I'm going to stop fighting. Those who want to continue to fight, we will make it this morning. So we don't even have to call and say, are you all right? Because those that want to continue to fight, let them keep fighting. But this word says that until God says it's over, it's going to continue. But when God says, when you seek my face, and, oh my God, I'm able to change the time in your experience. When you seek my face, I'm able to show up and restore and repay you for everything that you lost. So you can encourage yourself when the enemy, oh my God, gets jealous because they see double on your life. You just spur your shoulders and keep on going and know that it's the favor of God and just say, I'm being repaid. I was studying this week about receiving a prophet's reward. And oh my God, I was studying and I was reading and part of the prophet's reward is, you know, 
being repaid for the cost of the anointing. People want what you got, but they don't want to go through and give up what you had to go through and give up to get what you got. People don't know the hell that you had to live through. They don't know the pain that you had to go through. They don't know your hurt. They don't know your displeasure. But they look at it with popular prophets reward. If Israel would have just accepted the words of Jeremiah and received the prophet in the name of the prophet, they would have received the prophet's reward much sooner. But because, oh my God, they wanted to fight and they wanted to do it their way and not receive the prophet. They had to accept the enemy fire and accept a mess, oh my God, in desolation. And so, God, we give your name, honor, and praise this morning. We thank you, God, and we are expecting to be repaid for our trouble. We are expecting to be repaid, oh God, for our sacrifice. No, we're expecting to be repaid double for what it cost us to be anointed. For what it cost us to follow you. For what it cost us to just fall on your face and trust you, God. God, we now pray for our enemies. Save our enemies. Oh, my God. Lift our enemies up, oh, God. We pray for the peace of our enemies. We pray for the peace of every enemy territory. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray for peace on our jobs. We pray for peace in the minds of our enemies, God. We understand and know that you are the Lord of hosts and that you are allowing all things to work together for our good. We understand and we know, God, that you orchestrated this. And we're going through because you are allowing us to go through, to bring us back to the place of our calling and choosing. And so, God, we're grateful and we're thankful that you called us this morning. We're thankful that you chose us this morning, God, except you be on our side. Where would we be? And so we believe your word, that you know the thoughts that you think toward us. Thoughts of peace, not of evil to give us an expected end and the desirable income and for that we give your name praise. We are expecting great things from a great God and the people of God say amen. All heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. If there be one within with us this morning who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sins, just lift your hand where you are. We do not want anyone leaving this place unsaved, not knowing the Lord. And if there be none, we thank you. Well, we see a hand. So everyone just pray this prayer after me. Father God, we believe and confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus. We believe that he lived, died, and arose to take away the sins of the world. I believe that I am forgiven because at this moment, I am asking for forgiveness. Make me your child. Adopt me into your family. I renounce every curse over my bloodline and I accept every blessing you have for me. And I believe that I am saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Heads are still bowed. If you've been visiting Yeshua and you do not have a church home and you would like to make Yeshua your church home, just lift your hand where you are and we would be more than happy to have you join this body of believers. Yes. If there be none, Sister Sylvia is coming with our announcements. Let's say amen for her as she comes. Amen. 